Ok. Bueno. Comenzamos. Ok, so uh, I'm going to be one of the last uh, presenters of the afternoon and of this uh, very nice uh, gathering of uh, scientists, engineers, and 3D printing enthusiasts. Uh, I, well, my name is uh, Daniel Pietro Semoli, I've presented before, so you all know me. Uh, I come from the Media Lab Prado in, in Spain, I, I work there. It's a cultural center uh, very well known for the uh, use of uh, in, um, technology in art installations. Uh, I'm going to show some of the more ludic and more artistic um, uses of 3D printing since we've been going over uh, mostly scientific and useful uses. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the other uh, aspects of 3D printing, the more ludic and uh, playful aspect of 3D printing. So I'm going to start to sh uh, show you a video. Sorry, Let's see if I find this, okay. So this is a really nice uh, piece from an artist called uh, Marcus Kaiser. Marcus Kaiser wanted to do a project in the, um, in the desert using a solar sinter, a sintering uh, machine for uh, fusing sand. I'm going to show you the video, so it's, um, fast forward a little bit because it's a bit long, but it's quite nice to, to see. So he went into the desert and he tried to have some self-sufficient installation, pretty much using what <coughs> the only things you can find in the desert being uh, sun, heat, and sand, of course. So you can see at the top he's got a really nice uh, lens to focus the most of the solar energy onto a beam. And of course he has all sorts of electronics to make a solar tracker so he can have, uh, he can um, take most of the energy as the sun moves and of course a photovoltaic panel to power all of this. and a nice little office. <laughs> yeah. One of the challenges he faced uh, during this installation was the fact that it, it was so hot that the electronics were having a lot of uh, hard time uh, coping with the heat. So he actually had to do some sorts, all sorts of crazy stuff to try and, uh, and, and cool the computers and everything, all the electronic equipment. Um. So the way a solar sinter, uh, I mean the way a sinter works is you're focusing energy on some type of, of in this case sand, uh, to make it solid and then you go layer by layer in a, in a sintering machine. This is done automatically. He was doing it manually, of course. So 
that's a close-up of the sand actually being solidified and then layer by layer changing You can tell it's very hot because he's got uh, some insulation gloves on. And of course, the end result is that, you know, he just throws away sand that was already there. <coughs> so it's a very nice and clean uh, installation. Using the sun power and uh, also serves as a proof of concept that you could make a larger structure like this and uh, perhaps maybe even print uh, some sort of housing um, because the, the pieces are quite solid. It's like a ceramic uh, kind of feel to it. But it's just, it's just uh, sand. It's just sand. sand. Yeah, sand and sun. So it's like it's like making glass. Okay, so yes, I wanted to show that because uh, since we're of course we're going to run out of time, and this was going to be the last uh, thing I was going to show. I, I showed it first, and then, so I'm going to continue with the presentation now. And just to say that, well, I heard somebody say uh, one of these days. I don't know who it was. Uh, that it, this was not additive manufacturing, it was addictive manufacturing. And I really like the, the term because I think the whole point of, or not the whole point, but one of the nicest things about 3D printing is that it's really fun. It's a very empowering, uh, very simple yet complex uh, technology. It's a lot of very simple things added up into one uh, element. And it's a really uh, very empowering. It's, it's all about doing it uh, yourself. Even uh, starting from the kit, when you build uh, the kits yourself, so you, you get a feel of that you are actually making the machine, and even if you don't make the machine but you operate it, the, even though the pieces are being made by the machine, you have a lot of, you have a lot of saying of what's uh, being printed and what's happening. So it gives you this sense of, of owning you know, the, the, the process, which I think is really nice. It's also uh, immediate. Uh, sort of I, I put there because some of the prints you've seen that take hours to make but it's but it's uh, nevertheless it's quite immediate in this day and age where we have everything is immediate we get emails and news uh, right away on our phones right away everything is very fast so this technology is also in, in that sense uh, very immediate and it's very of course uh, rewarding to make uh, make things to make a nice things, to, to make a rings for a present or to make a spare part for something that has broken that you make it yourself is something uh, very rewarding and of course it's a mesmerizing technology. Everybody has spent a, lo a lot of uh, time printing but most of the time we're just looking at the machine print and um, most of us that have printed many, many, many hours still just stare, uh, stare looking at the machine just mesmerized by it. 
And uh, if you don't believe me, well, here's a um, print that is worth a thousand words. This was yesterday. Uh, one of our friends was uh, printing a part. And by the half of the part, about uh, one hour and a half into the part, or two hours into the part, the piece started to move. And uh, I told him, oh, OK, stop it, start it again. And he was just determined to have his piece. I think it was his uh, first 3D printed piece. He even got some help from some friends, some energy here coming, <laughs> some input. Um, that we that he had uh, to you know with with uh, withstand the print, and uh, by the end of the I can I can't really see here, but it's a it says the time is I think it's about three hour print. So he was there for at least one hour to get his print. So it's addictive manufacturing really. So even even back in the days when all of this movement about making your printers started, the second uh, rule of, of 3D printing, or, or I mean the first rule of 3D printing, was that your first print, of course, was you know a blob or a, in the best case scenario was a cube, but the second print had to be a glass shot, you know, and uh, this glass shot was so you could uh, drink and uh, you know rejoice on having your own built 3D printing. And uh, this, I like, this picture I like really much. This picture is four years old. It's found on Thingiverse, you can look it up. But this picture is uh, four years old. And you can see how you know, the, 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 the layers are not touching. This is not even solid. So you would pour the liquid and it would come out. But it was just so nice to, to, to have something that could make things. And of course, the most obvious thing was a container. And now you can find many things in, in Thingiverse of people that have done the same thing, and of course, some you know pour some um, you know energy into it, and um, so that's uh, of course very very nice and very ludic. It's very easy to understand. But seriously, let's talk about finding the professional way in the in the professional environment, which would be like the, the <coughs> art environment, you know. So seriously, quote and. The first being, of course, building custom pieces or repairing existing pieces that have uh, broken from, um, from an installation, for example. And most of, the, most of our interactive art installations or, or art installations that have some technology built in are, are um, composed of various electronics and various sensors and motors and you know, all of these things that make up a, an art installation. Uh, and, um, and so, of course, you need housings for these electronics. Uh, housings not only because of the aesthetics of your piece, uh, because you need some neatness to make some order, because you have so many cables, so many motors, so many actuators, sensors, and whatnot. And also, uh, you want to, of course, make uh, all the art installations are very, very different. So there's no, there's n nothing is, uh, no art installation is like the other. So everything has to be custom made for this. And of course, uh, the last but not least, you want to avoid uh, noise, um, you know, in interference uh, from all your signals, of course. And so as Mar um, so we're seeing the video yesterday uh, for uh, that show, uh, Marco showed about Arduino, and we can see here some of lots of uh, Arduino being the core of most of the interactive art uh, installations that we know today, because it's very um, uh, very easy, simple to use, and you can see here that all of the uh, you know cables and wiring that can have depending on the installation you have. So. Having housings for, for this uh, to house these components is, of course, very useful. Here you can see the proto board and everything, you know, the, the microphone here. And so having this in a neat way makes you uh, work in a more organized way. And of course, uh, you can take it, you know, this is a housing done. This is uh, an Arduino lab that fits in a box. And you can just then close this box and you can see the hex uh, wrenches here that serve as a hinge and you can just close this little door and then have this little cube where you have a, a, also a drawer for components here. So everything can be done with a 3D printer. Uh, and you can also take it to the next level, make a housing for, you know, for your Arduino board. And of, of course, then you, you add some sort of uh, aesthetics looks. Here is the open hardware symbol for some of you that don't know it. And of course, some holes for you to uh, you know, pushing the pins, the headers of the sensors that you're using. And then, of course, you can make things like this, which is 
everything, this, all of this is printed, the buttons are printed, the slider for, for the potentiometer is also printed. So, you know, you can make all these uh, nice things that otherwise would be impossible to, to have or very difficult to have. And um, talking about this, I want to show you real quick the RGBDT uh, toolkit, which is um, a toolkit com um, composed of an a uh, Kinect or an action, ASUS action uh, camera mounted parallel to an uh, HD DSL, DSLR camera. So you can make movies with a, with a depth, um, a 3D depth layer added to it. And as you can see here, uh, you could actually from this data, you can, uh, it says uh, CGI and video uh, hybrid, the data can be re photographed from any angle in post. Because you are obtaining 3D data from there, you can actually stop the movie in mid, in, in mid um, you know, wh while you're playing it, and you can play around with the different angles and, and do all sorts of uh, neat stuff with it. So I'm gonna show you what a movie shot like that is. But first I wanna show you uh, the project because it's in SketchUp. You can see, oops, sorry. You can see here. Well, we're familiar with SketchUp. We've been using it for the last couple of days. You can see here what the actual piece looks like. The Kinect is here, and then here you can mount the SLR camera. And this is on a standard tripod mount. And this is what it actually looks like. And you can see the well. You can see the Kinect there. It's mounted into a standard tripod head. Of course, here's the, the standard mount and the, and the mount for the, for the DSLR camera. And this is the typical things that otherwise would mean that you're going to end up using a lot of duct tape and uh, cable ties to get this together. And this is a really nice, sturdy way to make this. And um, of course, when you're shooting, you need to have you know, very stable uh, components. So now I'm going to show you, I'm going to close this, I'm going to go ahead and close it and show you what uh, this movie actually looks like, if I find it. Yep, this is the, um, the web page of, of the toolkit, they, f and they uh, put it in Kickstarter of course, and I'll show you how a film looks because it's uh, quite nice to see. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then let's just go do like a quick one. This is a workshop that they did in Barcelona, and you can see here sort of like the um, Radiohead video that they did just using uh, cloud points. That of course was shot with a gazillion dollar camera. This is using a hundred dollar um, Kinect and of course a nice maybe a thousand dollar DSLR camera. Then you can make stuff like this. He's actually with his voice He's distorting the image. You're gonna see now somebody clapping and when they clap, the, the noise tells the, the image to do some stuff. Who wants to clap? Oh! <laughs> okay. Mm. So that's uh, also quite fun thing uh, to do, and uh, it's not impossible to do with a 3D printer. It's just a lot easier. Okay. So where were we now? Okay. Another nice thing about working with uh, 3D printers is, you know, everybody complains about the size. Uh, 3D printing, uh, it takes a lot of time, it's not exactly fast. But you can, you know, work around and do uh, some other uh, nice stuff just, you know, by decomposing larger structures from smaller things. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. We did a workshop about a couple of years ago in, um, in Arte Lego, which is an also an art, uh, a cultural center in uh, San Sebastian, up in Basque uh, County, in, um, Basque Country, sorry, in, in Spain. And the workshop was called uh, Tresnac Tools. And what we were doing, let's see if I find the web page for that. 
Uh, what we were doing was taking. Uh, sorry, guys, bear with me for one second. What we were doing was we were doing these very tiny, very small little pieces printed on a thingomatic that I that I brought from Media Lab, and we were you can see here the the pieces being the design. And what we were doing is we were using these um, pieces as joints to make up larger components. Uh, let's see if I can find a picture here that illustrates that. And you can see here, this is all, you can see the, 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 all of these joints are printed. And this is fiberglass uh, rods that were about two millimeters in, in thick. And the workshop was all done with architects and they were, of course, architects think super big and they wanted to So you can see that they were, you know, here concealing the pieces in the chalkboard. Yes? Hola? Yeah? Okay. So, yeah, then um, let's see if some other pictures come up. These were not the most uh, nicest structures, but anyway, it was a way of, of constructing volumes. Then they added clothing to all of this, so they would make these really, really nice volumes. Like I was saying before, you can see here that there is some duct tape used for joints. This was, of course, done for you know prototyping purposes. Then they they, they changed, and it, it was about four, uh, five or six groups. Each group had a different uh, design for. Um, well, this is uh, the place we were at. It's a beautiful place. That's why those pictures. And but they were using all sorts of different designs for the for the joints. It was maybe each each group de the, um, designed uh, four or five different uh, pieces. Let's see if I can find one. Uh, you can see here, okay, here's, uh, well, this is a nice picture because it uh, was a chemistry uh, building and you can see the periodic table that they had placed in the, in the facade. It was just a beautiful place. Uh, and you can see here a close-up view of the joints. Okay, so that's an, uh, one way to <laughs> obtain the, um, larger structures is to use them as joints. And now I'm going to show you, okay, where am I now? Uh, of course, we saw yesterday these images from from Cosmo uh, Wenman. Uh, we saw it in. Um, I, I showed them to you before. This is a horse made up. You can see here. I use this picture because you can see here the joints um, where the, he glued together. This is done in, in YPLA, and then it was you know sanded and given a nice uh, finish. Uh, also, we saw this image uh, yesterday in one of the presentations. Uh, Cosmo Women asked for the, the for the models of these uh, skulls, and then he made this is all done in, in also in, in PLA. And uh, I want to show you because he's he's got a really nice uh, page. Let's see where we're at. Um, anyway, there's a video of him. In, in, you can you can see his page, and there is a nice video of him showing the whole process. Uh, okay. Anyway. Oh, okay, here we go. And you can see here that he's, he, this is the Hypnos uh, head that he scanned in, um, using the, the 1, 2, 3D catch application, taking many, many pictures, maybe in the hundreds, of an existing sculpture. <coughs> then, of course, adding the information and making the whole process of, of stitching the images to produce a mesh and then to 3D print. And I think that going from that little glass shot four years ago to this, I think it's quite uh, impressive. 
you can see, I mean, the finish that he gives of, it's, it's incredible because you can see here the joints of the pieces, but then that's the only hint that you get. I mean, if you didn't know this, this was a printed piece, yeah, I mean, you can see how he actually represents the, um, the, uh, the oxidation process of an old uh, statue. So it's, uh, well, well, he's an artist, so he can, of course, have, has all the means to, to reproduce this, but it's still quite impressive to, to have it come out of a printer, actually. And now I'm going to show you a, a project by another artist, a Spanish artist called Abelardo Gil Fournier. He's got a project called the Master Project. And um, if, uh, can somebody hand me those structures over there, the cat at the top? Yeah, thank you. And now also there is another one in the middle over there with some nails uh, inside. That one, yeah. That's it. Okay, so these are a couple of structures he did. What he did was, uh, Abelardo is a physicist and uh, artist, musician, and uh, programmer, all in one. And um, he had this um, idea of acquiring data from existing uh, X structures. So what he does is he takes an X structure, an existing STL, and decomposes the, the facets. Of, of course, we've know that all the we've seen that all the pieces that we that we're printing uh, on a smaller level, they're just made up of little triangles. So this is what he uh, came up with, taking this information of these triangles, uh, mixing them together to form you know printable pieces. Because of course, this piece right here, I mean, this uh, head is composed of about 80 different pieces. And of course, 80 is nothing when, you, when, you're, when we're talking about uh, thousands of triangles, the way we, uh, Carlo was showing us yesterday to reduce the number of triangles in a mesh. But anyway, he produces, using processing application, he takes this STL image and then decomposes it into smaller or actually bigger but printable parts so he can get a smaller number of parts. And here at the bottom, you, don't, you can't really see, but actually the pieces have printed a number. So you can then make this into a one uh, larger piece. It's like a 3D puzzle. And also, this, all these pieces, are, th th nothing is glued. This is our joints that are printed, so you have to join them yourself. So this is a quite uh, nice example of, of, of taking, um, you can, uh, I, I'm not gonna pass it around because it's a bit fragile, but you can come up here and, and take a look at it afterwards if you want. And another um, aspect of his project, uh, which is also quite uh, incredible to see, it's, let's see if I can find it here somewhere. Hold on one second. And, uh, sorry, I'm, okay, here we go. So the project is called uh, MASTA, and it's an acronym for My Atoms Are Your Atoms, but in Spanish, Mis Atomos Son Tus Atomos. And you can see the project here, here's his web page, and you can see like all the different joints to make different things. This is to attach uh, little rods, this is for nails. Uh, this is the one I, I showed you before to make uh, triangle-like uh, pieces. And you can see an explanation here of what he actually does. Sorry, in the tool section. And you can see how he decomposes uh, existing images. And this is an example of what, I, of what I'm holding in my hand. It's a series of printed joints. None of these joints are the same. The way the angles, the way that these holes here are in the piece, although they look horizontal, they are not. They have a, a, a unique angle of insertion. And then all of these nails are inserted. And then you have to have a map also. And it's a quite intricate but easy to understand a mapping system where eight uh, goes into nine and then nine or six goes into six and then afterwards you get a piece like this and what he does he does is he takes already existing physical pieces like nails or, or toothpicks or whatever and produces these kind of uh, structures which at the end what they are is a representation of the external shell of an existing 
piece. And you can see here, I'll show you a little video of what it, it means to actually do this. Here's, um, you can see the sliders here. And what he does is he throws all these, these balls that will attach to this piece. You can, with the sliders, he can decide the size of these uh, balls. Of course, all these balls are the same diameter. And then he defines uh, variables like uh, how uh, close together they're going to be, and you know all sorts of, of other physical variables. Because of course, this is a physical universe that he's representing here. And at the end, he will remove the inner part, and then he will get the sorry the balls. And then he will get the representation of all these. This would be like the nails that I'm showing you here. And of course, you can see here like. Uh, Errors where two balls or some balls didn't actually fall here, so you end up with a with a small hole in the in the structure. But of course, this is you know it's it's no problem that it happens. You can actually add more balls to it if you want. And what's um, what's really nice about this uh, process is that uh, or interesting is that of course this does not take into account when you're going to put all this together. You, you don't take into account. Uh, gravity, which of course affects all these pieces, and then when you're putting them together, and they're supposed to be here because they weigh a lot, and all of these uh, forces are acting into all of the pieces, they will start moving around. So it's, uh, it's a very painstaking and um, patient-consuming process, but it's also very, very nice to have uh, come together. It takes about uh, maybe an hour to put one of these together. And um, then it's, uh, here we have also the, uh, one of the first uh, projects that I saw about you know, doing art specifically with 3D printers was done by Marius Watts. Marius Watts is also an artist that works a lot with processing. And all of these pieces that he created here uh, were actually produced with a processing script. There is no standard, uh, I should say, modeling here. This all started by an equation or, or you know, lines of code that then are represented and exported as an STL, and then are, uh, of course, uh, printed. Not all of them can be printed, but some of them are. We, um, Marius Watts was the first artist in residence in, in, in MakerBot, and uh, he, well, all of these collections can, can be found in, in Thingiverse, of course. You can print your own. I have printed some of those pieces. It's really nice to see them come together. And uh, where am I now? And uh, now I'm going to show you a, a, a project by an artist called uh, David Bowen. He did a uh, really nice uh, installation called um, growth, uh, pro um, sorry, growth Processing uh, System. Let me. Growth, sorry, he changed the, main, the name, so I'm confused now. Growth modeling device, and what it was is actually he. This is this combines laser scanning. He's scanning uh, the the leaves of, a, of an onion here, and while he's scanning this in real time, there is um, an FFF machine, uh, you know, just a 3D printer, but without the structure, just the head here that is printing. Uh, the onion. He takes different uh, <laughs> perspectives of the onion and then show you here what it looks like in the video because it's quite impressive to see. This, this is, uh, you know, art installations that the core of the installation is a 3D printing device the way the Marcus Kaiser was doing with his laser center. He's scanning here the, 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 the onion leaf, of course, and now it's being printed. And this is absurdly slow. I mean, he had to really, really, really bring down the speed of the motors here. And I was lucky enough to see this installation in uh, it won uh, uh, a Vida Award. Vida is a, is a very prestigious award given by the Telefonica uh, company in Spain. And they gave it to art, uh, um, electronic art installations. Uh, he won, uh, I think, first prize with this piece. and. It's really nice to, to see because it's, it's a bit confusing because he's scanning something that is not, um, it's not 
it's not stable is the word, it's co continually growing and at the same time <laughs> he's scanning it and printing it so you know it's a, it's a, it creates a nice little paradox and of course you know the aesthetics of the whole process you know you can see all the wiring and you can see everything and for me I really like art installations, electronic art installations when you can understand easily what's going on and this is something that you see and you right away understand what's 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 happening and I was lucky enough to actually see him and, and uh, uh, this is back in 2009 back when uh, you know 3D printing was just in, in the, the very early stages this is actually a rep wrap uh, head you can see actually I don't know if you can see it but, but this is a DC motor back in the days uh, there was not uh, they, they were not using stepper motors still on the on the heads these motors were uh, much more common and they gave a lot of problems that's why now all of these machines have stepper motors on the on the head but yeah I mean and then there's a conveyor belt here and so when this is done it moves and then all of these uh, leaves are actually falling in a crate and being uh, collected also a really nice example of uh, 3D printing being used as the core or as the soul uh, an, of an art installation. And yeah, like I was saying, the end result is a paradox since the printer is producing a static piece of plastic of a living organism that is constantly changing. So it's, um, it's quite nice to, to, to see it. Uh, Marcus Kaiser already showed you and now I'm going to show you another example of what I like about 3D printing which is distributed fabrication and well these guys at the Fab Lab Sevilla took it one step farther and called it teletransportation you be the judge but it was a nice little very simple um, very simple whoop, here we go very simple project that uh, f uh, Fab Lab from Seville wanted uh, um, a lot of people to take uh, part of. They, they just designed a, a cup, and you can see it here, the cup that they designed like a standard uh, kind of, of, of cup. You can see here also another um, photo of it. And what they did was what this cup, this STL, was sent out to all the participants that wanted to uh, partake into this, into this um, sort of action, I guess. And the idea was to teletransport this piece to all different parts of the world and then have people add something to the design. The design was actually without uh, any of this texture. This, uh, all the people at the different uh, um, you know, places where this took place added something to, to, to the cup and then just printed it and then just even either sent a videos or a photo of it and then they put this all in a nice blog and you know it's a nice concept because we forget how incredible these little machines are where I can sit here design something for example this whistle put it up on a website or send it to somebody across the globe and if they have a 3D printer they have the same whistle in their hand you know and the only distance is how much time you're gonna take to print it. So I'm gonna show you a nice uh, little video of this and with this I'm gonna be about uh, done. So you can see here what's nice little video that was put together by one of the people that participated in this and this of course is the Andean range, that's the Merida Mountains right there because this was done in Merida and uh, this is actually, I should say, the first 3D printer uh, homemade that we have in Venezuela and of course in Merida. Quite, of course, an artistic video of uh, the piece being made. done in dual color to make it stand out a little bit. A lot of Venezuelan pride on that video, of course. Where is this place? Uh, it's a little town called Merida. 
I don't know if you've heard of it, but you can see here it's. So it's also a homage to the espresso drinkers that we all are. And um, yeah, with that, um, I will show you my last slide, of course. And uh, thank you for being here and for listening to me. And these, of course, are my 3D printed uh, glasses uh, that I forgot to bring, sorry. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's me. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. What is that?